pour hundreds of American tanks against what is left of Iraq's Republican Guard. How the war was won by the man who planned it. How the Iraqis believed the U.S. would come by sea. And the Hail Mary that made the difference. The Kuwaitis say the nightmare has ended. And Kuwait City comes alive. From ABC, this is a special edition of World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. The war in the Gulf is virtually over. President Bush is going to talk to the nation tonight at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. The commanding general, Norman Schwarzkopf, said today that the Allied forces have accomplished their mission. The Iraqi army is no longer a threat to the region. The last great battle was being fought today. U.S. tanks and air power overwhelming what used to be called the elite Republican Guard. It has apparently been the conclusive battle, the final blow. We begin at the Pentagon tonight. ABC's Bob Zelnick has been compiling the details. Officials say the Iraqis lost hundreds of tanks in the battle. Officials say as Allied forces approached from the west, elements of the Guard divisions came forward to meet them. But the Iraqis came under heavy fire, mainly from Apache helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft like the A-10. As they tried to turn and flee, Allied tanks used superior speed to outflank them, and their long-range guns to destroy many of the Iraqi tanks from so far away that the Iraqis could not fire back. The remaining tanks and troop carriers tried to fight their way eastward toward Basra, but officials say many of those were destroyed by pursuing aircraft. Officials say the Iraqi units appear to have been surprised by the Allied attack and once again seemed unable to coordinate their attack because of bad communications. This may explain why the guards never moved south to defend Kuwait. Pentagon officials say U.S. casualties were light. While the battle involved only three of the eight Republican Guard divisions, the remaining five are light infantry. In the view of senior officials here, the Republican Guard as a threat to Iraq's neighbors is finished. Bob Zelnick, ABC News at the Pentagon. There was another primarily tank battle in which the Iraqis were also virtually wiped out around the airport near Kuwait City. One U.S. commander said more than 100 Iraqi tanks were destroyed there, but he added he wasn't completely sure. After 100, he said, you tend to lose count. Here's ABC's Bill Redeker. Early this morning, troops of the 1st Marine Division fought to finish off the last Iraqi stronghold in Kuwait City, the International Airport. By daybreak, it was over. Marines collected the spoils of war, weapons, ammunition, and an Iraqi helicopter. While the formal, more ceremonial liberation of the city was left up to the Kuwaiti and Saudi armies, the Marines quickly secured the western and southern sections of the city. A combination of smoke from more than 500 oil well fires and bad weather actually helped the Marines. Uh, visibility sometimes was less than uh, 50 meters, and we surprised them. I think the speed with which we moved surprised them. American and British armored divisions also used the element of surprise to attack the Republican guards in western Kuwait. The tank battle ended in the destruction of the southernmost Republican Guard division and the defeat of a division of Iraq's armored reserve. But there were Allied losses as well. This afternoon, an American A-10 tank killer accidentally attacked two British armored personnel carriers, killing nine British soldiers. Four others were killed by Iraqi fire. The company commander called his men together to talk about the loss. We took a knock yesterday. But you're all grown men. We're all soldiers, and we go on. I'm very proud of you last night. It didn't seem to affect what we did in the slightest. So thank you very much indeed. We go on, boys. Throughout the land campaign, American generals say they have benefited from low morale among Iraqi soldiers. My view is that uh, their heart just wasn't in it. Uh, POWs have, have said this, uh, deserters told us this early on. Uh, we don't know why we're here. We don't know why we invaded Kuwait. Tell them not to worry, they're going to be all right. The military says it can no longer say with accuracy how many prisoners of war have been collected. Today, the estimate was more than 50,000. 
Poorly fed and poorly equipped, American officers said Iraqi soldiers had another problem. And the incoming was from their own artillery trying to stop them from deserting or surrendering. They were trying to shoot their own people. They were trying to shoot their own people. With the Iraqi army on the verge of collapse, American soldiers are already working on the next phase, clearing out pockets of resistance and searching buildings for booby traps and other explosives. Tonight, Central Command will not say when the war will be over, but privately, officers are saying virtually all of the fighting could be finished within a few hours. Bill Redeker, ABC News, Saudi Arabia. There will be a lot of attempts to put this in military perspective. Military historians tell us today there's never been a war in which one army has suffered so few losses while inflicting such heavy damage on the other. The cost in lives to the U.S., 79 Americans have died since the war began. 44 are missing. In the ground war alone, 28 Americans have now been killed, plus 23 pilots and 28 reservists, including two women who died when that Scud missile hit their barracks in Saudi Arabia on Monday. At his briefing today, General Schwarzkopf would not estimate how many Iraqis have died, but he said the number was, his words, large, very, very large. Twenty-nine Iraqi divisions have been destroyed or made ineffective. In a moment, General Schwarzkopf will explain how the war was fought and won, and the people of Kuwait celebrate their liberation. <laughs> This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, brought to you by Preparation H. 41 days since the war started, four days of fighting on the ground. From the very beginning, the commander of Allied forces has said that he wanted to keep military operations secret, but when the time was right, he would tell us all how he planned it. Today was the day. Basically, the problem we were faced with was this. When you looked at the troop numbers, they really outnumbered us about three to two. And if when you consider the number of combat service support people we have, that's logisticians and that sort of thing in our armed forces, as far as fighting troops, we were really outnumbered two to one. In addition to that, they had about 4,700 tanks versus our 3,500 when the buildup was complete, and they had a great deal more artillery than we do. What we did, of course, was start an extensive air campaign, and I briefed you in quite some detail on that in the past. One of the purposes I told you at that time of that extensive air campaign was to isolate the Kuwaiti theater of operation by taking out all the bridges and supply lines that ran between the north and the southern part of Iraq. That was to prevent reinforcement and supply coming into the southern part of Iraq and the Kuwaiti theater of operation. We also at that time had a very active naval presence out in the Gulf, and we made sure that everybody understood about that naval presence one of the reasons why we did that is because it became very apparent to us early on that the Iraqis were quite concerned about an amphibious operation across the shores to liberate Kuwait, this being Kuwait City. Uh, they put a very, very heavy barrier uh, of infantry along here, and they proceeded to build an extensive barrier that went all the way across the border, down and around and up the side of Kuwait. So we continued our heavy operations out in the sea because we wanted the Iraqis to continue to believe that we were going to conduct a massive amphibious operation in this area. I think this is probably one of the most important parts of the entire briefing I could talk about. As you know, very early on, we took out the Iraqi Air Force. We knew that he had very, very limited reconnaissance means, and therefore, when we took out his Air Force, for all intents and purposes, we took out his ability to see what we were doing down here in Saudi Arabia. Once we had taken out his eyes, we did what could best be described as the Hail Mary play in football. When we knew that he couldn't see us anymore, we did a massive movement of troops all the way out to the west, to the extreme west, because at that time we knew that he was still fixed in this area with the vast majority of his forces, and once the air campaign started, he would be incapable of moving out to, to counter this move, even if he knew we made it. I must tell you, I, I can't recall any time in the annals of military history when this number of forces have moved over this distance to put themselves in a position to be able to, to, to uh, attack. Not only did we move the troops out there, but we literally moved thousands and thousands of tons of fuel, of ammunition, of spare parts, of water and of food out here into this area because we wanted to have enough supplies on hand 
so that if we launched this and we got into a slugfest battle, which we very easily could have gotten into, we'd have enough supplies to last for 60 days. Our plan initially had been to start over here in this area and do exactly what the Iraqis thought we were going to do, and that's take them on head on into their most heavily defended area. At four o'clock in the morning, the Marines, the 1st Marine Division and the 2nd Marine Division launched attacks through the barrier system. They were accompanied by the 2nd, uh, uh, the Tiger Brigade, U.S. Army Tiger Brigade of the 2nd Armored Division. At the same time, over here, two Saudi task forces also launched a penetration through this barrier. But while they were doing that, at 4 o'clock in the morning over here, the 6th French Armored Division, accompanied by a brigade of the 82nd Airborne, also launched an overland attack to their objective up in this area, Al Salman Airfield. And we were held up a little bit by the weather, but uh, by 8 o'clock in the morning, the 101st Airborne Air Assault launched an air assault deep in the enemy's territory to establish a forward operating base in this location right here. I can't say enough about the two Marine divisions. I, I, the, I, if I use words like brilliant, it would really be an under-description of the absolutely superb job that they did in breaching the so-called impenetrable barrier. Uh, it was a classic, absolutely classic, military breaching of a very, very tough minefield, barbed wire, fire trenches type barrier. Uh, they went through the first barrier like it was water. They went across into the second barrier line, even though they were under artillery fire at the time. They continued to open up that breach, and then they brought both divisions streaming through that breach. We launched another uh, Egyptian Arab force in this location and another Saudi force in this location, again, to penetrate the barrier, but once again to make the enemy continue to think that we're doing exactly what he wanted us to do, and that's make a headlong assault into a very, very tough barrier system, a very, very tough mission for these folks here. Once the 101st had their forward operating base established here, they then went ahead and launched into the Tigris and Euphrates Valley. The next two days went exactly like we thought they would go. The Saudi forces that came in and took the, and, and Arab forces that came in and took these two initial objectives turned to come in on the flank heading towards Kuwait City, located right in this area here. Uh, the British UK passed through and continued to attack up this flank, and of course the Seventh Corps came in and attacked in this direction, as shown here. The 24th Infantry Division made an unbelievable move all the way across into the Tigris and Euphrates Valley and proceeded in blocking this avenue of egress grass out, uh, which was the only avenue of egress left because we continued to make sure that the bridges stayed down. So there was no way out once the 24th was in this area and the 101st continued to operate in here. The French, having succeeded in achieving all of their objectives, then set up a flanking position, a flank guard position here to make sure that no forces could come in and get us from the flank. By this time, we had destroyed or rendered completely ineffective over 21 Iraqi divisions. Next, please. And of course, that then brings us to today. Where we are today is we now have a solid wall across the north of the 18th Airborne Corps consisting of the units shown right here attacking straight to the east. We have a solid wall here again of the 7th Corps also attacking straight to the east. I wonder if in an, if an overview, despite these uh, enormously illustrative pictures, you could, you could say what's left of the Iraqi army in terms of how long could it be before he could ever be a, a regional threat or a threat to the region again? Well, there's not enough left of the, at all for him to be a regional threat to the region, an offensive regional threat. Uh, as you know, he's got a very large army, but most of the army that is left north of the Tigris-Euphrates Valley is an infantry army. It's not an armored army. It's not an armor-heavy army, which means it really isn't an offensive army. So it doesn't have enough left unless someone chooses to rearm them in the future. The general used these figures to show just how badly the Iraqi army had been chewed up. More than 3,000 Iraqi tanks destroyed, 88% of his tanks in the Kuwaiti theater, 65% of Iraq's armored vehicles, and 69% of the artillery. We will have more on the Schwarzkopf briefing later in this special edition of World News Tonight. And ABC will broadcast the entire briefing later this evening right after Nightline with Ted Koppel reporting from the Gulf. And we'll have more news in just a moment.
Ask me what counts most after 40 years in the car business and I don't have to think twice. One, the minivans. We invented them. Two, driver's airbags in every car we build in this country. What do we do for an encore? Put them together. Minivans with a driver's side airbag. Nobody else is doing it. You still have to use your seatbelt with a minivan airbag, but it will save lives. A lot of lives. For the first time in seven months, the Kuwaiti flag is flying over Kuwait City. For thousands of Kuwaitis, it was a day for celebration, but also anger. ABC's Forrest Sawyer is in Kuwait City. This was the day the people of Kuwait City came back out of the shadows. The day they reclaimed the streets they had left deserted through seven long months of Iraqi occupation. I never seen these people in the seven months. I am seeing everybody of them now, which is the first time. Allied soldiers rumbled into the city this morning to be greeted as conquering heroes. Women chanted praises for President Bush. American symbols were badges of honor. Kuwait's day of freedom brought something old. Saudi soldiers doing traditional sword dances. And something new. Children born today called babies of Tahrir, or liberation. On the road to Kuwait City, U.S. Marines joined the celebration. While inside, at the U.S. Embassy, a Marine reconnaissance team went about the serious business of collecting more Iraqi prisoners of war straggling into surrender, a sign there is still plenty of work and worry ahead. For all the celebration here, there is still terror and loss. Thousands of people are still missing their loved ones, picked up by the Iraqis, and they have no idea where they may be. So they've collected women, children, and, uh, and young men between the age of 15 to 55. Uh, we don't know where they're held. We don't know where they are held. Are they inside Kuwait or are they outside? We don't know. Bitterness and rage spilled out in the celebration. Saddam's image set afire. His currency, an object of contempt. For the first time today, Kuwaitis ventured out to see and touch the images of Saddam's control. Anti-aircraft guns. The bunkers looking out to the sea. The weapons left behind by retreating troops. And they looked ahead, past the celebration to all that must be rebuilt, from the city's amusement park to the royal palaces. Already, Kuwaitis have a feel for the long road to recovery. Citizens of one of the richest oil nations in the world are lining up to buy supplies of gasoline. And there are companies around the world lining up for their share of the contracts that they hope to receive to help the project of rebuilding the infrastructure of Kuwait a multi-billion dollar project that at least unofficially has already begun starting today. Peter? For the same question as it was yesterday, what's been your strongest impression today? Ah, uh, today is a very different impression. You know, I, I told you yesterday, Peter, that my impression was of the, the terrible deserted nature of the city and that pall of smoke that hung over everything, the way the city seemed so empty. Today, entirely different. As soon as those APCs and Jeeps came rolling through with the gunfire in the air, people streamed out of their homes, they came out carrying flags, and it was an entirely transformed place. This is a city that has begun to lighten up, has begun to face the fact that uh, there is freedom in the air, and they hope to keep it that way. Any sign of the Kuwaiti government that's been in exile? The Kuwaiti government has not yet arrived. In fact, I have seen some low-level uh, government officials, and I think they are a bit frustrated that things are moving as slowly as they are. That is certainly true for a lot of the businessmen who stayed right here and did not leave this country when they were so terribly afraid. Okay, Forrest, thanks very much. Talk to you again tomorrow. The American embassy in Kuwait City, which Forrest mentioned, will soon be back in business. The State Department says the new ambassador to Kuwait, Skip Ghanim, should be in place within the next few days. He was appointed to the job in January, and he's been working out of Saudi Arabia. He replaces Nathaniel Howell. You remember the ambassador who spent 110 days as a virtual prisoner inside the embassy after the Iraqi invasion. We'll have more news in just a moment. Last fall, Saddam Hussein said that his own people would never forgive him if he withdrew from Kuwait. The Soviet Middle East specialist Evgeny Primakov says that Hussein told him last October that after giving Iran back all the territory that Iraq had captured during eight years of war, 
he could never give up Kuwait as well. Well, now with his military in a state of collapse, Hussein has tried again to stop the actual fighting. And once again, the answer from the White House is that he has bungled it. Here's ABC's Britt Hume. At the UN this morning, Iraq's ambassador said its troops were all out of Kuwait and the war should stop. Well, we believe it is the duty of the Security Council to issue a resolution declaring a ceasefire and an end to all hostilities. And with the understanding that Iraq had already undertaken to abide by all the resolution. But at the White House, spokesman Fitzwater cited a cable to the UN from Iraqi Foreign Minister Tariq Aziz. In it, Iraq accepted some of the UN resolutions, but demanded the UN in return lift its trade sanctions. This is still a conditional offer, Fitzwater said, and it falls well short of what is necessary. The president, who met here today with British Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd, wants the sanctions to continue, though everyone knows that will make it impossible for Iraq to pay war reparations to Kuwait, as the UN has also demanded. Outside later, Hurd explained why. There are going to be a whole lot of matters well, they say which need to be that. settled after a ceasefire. And a during, during that, I think, uh, during that time, Clearly, sanctions will need to remain. As long that as, uh, was echoed in more specific terms later by Secretary of State Baker. We uh, will want to make certain, at least with respect to arms, that there's some sort of uh, constraints upon uh, rearmament and the shipment of uh, arms into uh, that country, and particularly weapons of mass destruction. Beyond an arms embargo, officials here say, they expect to continue a general trade embargo as a lever to try to pry Saddam Hussein out of power. As one senior official here put it, quote, we would like to do all we can to help the Iraqi people identify the root cause of their problem. Peter? Fritz, there's been an almost desperate scene at the United Nations today with the Iraqi ambassador trying to get a ceasefire. The UN saying again what you've been saying, only when all the resolutions are accepted. And he says the U.S. keeps moving the goalpost back on him. True or not? Well, officials here would certainly deny that they're doing that, and unfortunately for the Iraqis, if they are indeed trying to stop this with a ceasefire, they keep coming up with these offers that have conditions in them, and whether they really mean them or not, they make it no problem at all for the administration to say no. Okay, Britt, thanks very much. Britt Hume of the White House. We'll have more news in just a moment. Remind you what we said at the beginning, the president is going to speak to the nation at 9 o'clock Eastern time tonight. And when our special edition of World News Tonight continues on most of these stations, we'll hear more of General Schwarzkopf briefing on the war and also take a look at the question of a war crimes trial. Tonight on Nightline, Ted Koppel reports live from the Gulf. As the Allied steamroller engages what's left of the Iraqi army, Saddam looks for a way out. Tonight. Don't hang up, Connecticut. Talk yourself into a bargain. From ABC, this special edition of World News Tonight with Peter Jennings continues. What appears to be the last big battle of the war is virtually over with hundreds of U.S. tanks in combat against the three most powerful divisions of the Republican Guard in southern Iraq. Pentagon sources say nearly all of the Iraqi tanks in those divisions have been destroyed. Earlier in the day, U.S. Marines forced the last Iraqi troops out of Kuwait City's airport, and U.S. and British armored divisions destroyed the last Republican Guard units in Kuwait itself. The streets of Kuwait City were filled with Kuwaitis for the first time since the Iraqis invaded in August. U.S. intelligence sources, though, say in the past few days, thousands of young Kuwaiti men were either taken away from the city, either to be killed, reportedly, or maybe even used as hostages. Meanwhile, Iraq made another attempt to get a ceasefire, but the White House again says the fighting will not stop until Iraq accepts all 12 U.N. resolutions. The U.N. Security Council is asking Iraq for a clear statement of what it intends. It has all happened so much more quickly than anyone ever predicted. And today, the Commander-in-Chief, Norman Schwarzkopf, told us all how it had been done. They start out with over 4,000 tanks. As of today, we have over 3,000 confirmed destroyed, and I do mean destroyed or captured. And as a matter of fact, that number is low because you can add 700 to that as a result of the battle that's going on right now with the Republican Guard. Uh, so that number is very, very high, and we've almost completely destroyed the offensive capability of the Iraqi forces in the Kuwaiti theater of operation. The armored vehicle count is also uh, 
uh, very, very high. And of course, you can see we're doing great damage to the artillery. The battle is still going on, and I suspect that these numbers will mount rather considerably. Yes, sir. It seems that you've done so much that the job is effectively done. Can I ask you what do you think really needs to be, more to be done? Because the forces are, his forces are, if not destroyed, certainly no longer capable of posing a threat to the region. They seem to want to go home. Uh, what more has to be done? If I'm to accomplish the mission that I was given, and that's to make sure that the Republican Guard is rendered incapable of conducting the type of heinous act that they've conducted so often in the past, what has to be done is these forces continue to attack across here and put the Republican Guard out of business. We're not in the business of killing them. We have PSYOPs aircraft up. We're telling them over and over again, all you got to do is get out of your tanks and move off, and you will not be killed. But they're continuing to fight, and as long as they continue to fight, we're going to continue to fight with them. Could I ask you uh, two questions? First, did you think that this would turn out? I realize a great deal of strategy and planning went into it, but when it took place, did you think this would turn out to be such an easy cakewalk as it seems? And, and secondly, what are your impressions of Saddam Hussein as a military strategist? Huh. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, if we thought it would have been such an easy, uh, easy fight, we definitely would not have stocked 60 days worth of supplies on these log bases. So, uh, it, as I told, as I've told you all for a very, very long time, it is very, very important for a military commander never to assume away the capabilities of his enemy. And when you're facing an enemy that is over 500,000 strong, has the reputation that they've had of fighting for eight years, being combat-hardened veterans, had the number of tanks and the type of equipment they had, you don't assume away anything. So we certainly did not expect it to go this way. As far as Saddam Hussein being a great military strategist, he is neither a strategist, nor is he schooled in the operational art, nor is he a tactician, nor is he a general, nor is he as a soldier. Other than that, he's a great military man. I want you to know that. <laughs> I got to tell you what, a soldier doesn't fight very hard for a leader who is going to shoot him okay, on, on his own whim. That's not what military leadership is all about. And so I attribute a great deal of the failure of the Iraqi army to fight to their own leadership. They committed to them to a cause that they did not believe in. Uh, they all are saying that they didn't want to be there. They didn't want to fight their fellow Arab. They were lied to. They were deceived. And when they went into Kuwait, they didn't believe in the cause. And then after they got there, they had a leadership that was so uncaring for them, okay, that they didn't properly feed them, they didn't properly give them water, and in the end, they kept them there only at the point of a gun. So I can't, uh, now the Republican Guard is entirely different. The Republican Guard are the ones that went into Kuwait in the first place. They get paid more, they get treated better, uh, and oh, by the way, they also were well to the rear here, okay, so they could be the first ones to bug out, okay, when, when the battlefield started folding, while these poor fellows up here who didn't want to be here in the first place bore the brunt of the attack. Well, that didn't happen. General Schwarzkopf said on that briefing, his mission is accomplished. We're joined again by ABC's Britt Hume at the White House, who I think knows what the president is going to tell the nation tonight, Britt. They're not telling us a lot about the speech, Peter, but I know a few things. He's not going to agree to a ceasefire, but he is going to say, basically, that the war is over. And this speech will represent his first attempt to outline how he plans to help try to organize the peace. Okay, Britt Hume with the White House, thanks very much. 9 o'clock Eastern Time, the President will speak to the nation. We will carry it live. And of course, the post-war period begins to bring up all sorts of new things, not least of which is a lot of talk about a possible war crimes trial. Here's ABC's John McCarthy. U.S. intelligence sources say in the three days before Kuwait was liberated, Iraqi forces rounded up thousands of young Kuwaiti men. Some were seen being marched toward Iraq, apparently to become hostages. Others simply vanished. In the seven months of Iraqi occupation, there have been frequent allegations of brutality and torture. But General Schwarzkopf said in the last week, it has escalated to what he called unspeakable atrocities. They're not a part of the same human race, uh, the people that did that, that the rest of us are. I gotta, I've got to pray that that's the case. This last burst of violence against Kuwaiti citizens by Iraqi forces, plus the more visible destruction of the Kuwaiti oil fields, has stunned and outraged the Bush administration and members of Congress. These atrocities demand more than just reparations. They demand justice. Anything short of Saddam's prosecution for war crimes would only enable him to fight another day 
and commit future atrocities. Special military teams have already been dispatched to Kuwait to gather evidence. Though the Bush administration is exploring the possibility of a war crimes tribunal more vigorously now than they were even a week ago, officials say there are many potential problems. Perhaps the biggest problem is that Saddam Hussein himself and most of his top advisors, all of whom are in Baghdad, will probably never be apprehended. John McWethy, ABC News, the State Department. We've been talking about when the war will end. General Schwarzkopf says it's virtually over. The president will say much the same thing. There is a perception, at least among some diplomats of the United Nations, that Iraq has been trying desperately hard to surrender today while the U.S. has been making it difficult. A little while ago, we spoke to the Saudi Arabian ambassador to the United States, Prince Bandar bin Sultan. He says it's Iraq, not the U.S., that is posing the difficulties. I just cannot understand why they want to prolong the agony and the suffering. All what they need to do except the United Nations resolutions totally and conditionally, and I think we'll be running. When do you think the sanctions should be lifted, Mr. Ambassador? That will depend on the discussion w the, that people could have uh, uh, in the Security Council. Saddam Hussein's uh, track and record is uh, not encouraging, and we want to make sure that uh, we all are comfortable with his intentions, Peter. Do you believe, sir, there should be war crimes trials? I believe there is reason to uh, think so based on everything I heard uh, that uh, the Iraqis have done uh, in Kuwait, yes. You have your finger on an awful lot of military intelligence. Do you think Saddam Hussein is going to be overthrown in the near future? Um, Peter, I, uh, I think the judge on that will be the Iraqi people, however, he definitely has caused so much misery and disasters, uh, unnecessary for his people. So I'm confident the Iraqi people and the Iraqi army will know what to do at the right time. And the Iraqi army, so that's what you really mean, that the Iraqi army can overthrow him even if the people can't, right? Well, I think it will help. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Kuwait Radio made it clear today what many Kuwaitis would like to see what happens next, the overthrow and the death of Saddam Hussein. To restore the security of the region, the radio said it is necessary to sever the head of the snake and remove all the poison. In a moment, the people of Baghdad, they too are wondering when it will end and how. Medics are caring for thousands of wounded Iraqi soldiers. We'll have a report on doctors in the reserve who wonder what will be left for them to come home to. A major election, a dangerous ice storm, a super victory. In times like these, you need a leader. Action News 8 has always led the way in Connecticut news coverage. First with the Connecticut Watch. First with an hour weekend newscast. First with the news at 5. First in presenting your views and answering your questions at our town meetings. And Connecticut's first choice during major news events. When news breaks, Action News 8 leads the way. Connecticut's first and best local newscast. At his briefing today, General Schwarzkopf said what he said before, that destroying Iraq was not the intention. At one point, he said U.S. forces were 150 miles away from Baghdad and there was nobody to stop them. If it had been our intention to overrun the country, he said we could have done it. In Baghdad, where the bombing continues, ABC's Bill Blakemore. Earlier hopes here in Baghdad for a ceasefire ended just after sunset in a ferocious Allied air raid which shook buildings across the capital. These attacks followed a day which had begun with a partial sense of relief here. News this morning that the battle for Kuwait was largely over and Baghdad radio reports that Iraqi forces were now out of Kuwait produced a noticeably more relaxed mood among early shoppers. Many told us they were still worried about relatives in the military and Iraqi announcements that some Iraqi forces were now fighting coalition forces on Iraqi soil led some to express a new defiance. This man said America's incursion into Iraq proved to him America's real aim was to destroy Iraq. And he said it made his countrymen support Saddam Hussein more than ever. Many Iraqis have said to us that evidence America wants to dominate here includes the bombing of oil refineries and of Iraq's major power plants, which mean Baghdad will be without electricity for a long time to come and without running water. With sanitation pumps not working, sewage is backing up into the streets. It will be a struggle just to bring back these basics as soon as the Iraqis get a chance to. Iraqi people or Arabic people, they don't like USA more. Why? 
Because they killed, you know, killed the Iraqi people. They killed children, they killed women, they killed all people for, for petrol. For petrol, for oil, Iraqis keep telling us America has crippled their nation. And they believe is still doing so even after gaining control of Kuwait. Bill Blakemore, ABC News in Baghdad. On this question of Iraq paying war reparations and where Iraq would find the money to pay for them anyway, the head of Kuwait's central bank has a suggestion. He says Kuwait may demand payments in the form of Iraqi oil. And if Iraq is forced to pay reparations to Kuwait, Iran says it wants to be paid as well. The Tehran Times, the English newspaper, says the Security Council must force Iraq to comply with an earlier resolution which calls for payment of reparations and damages caused by the eight years of the war Iraq fought with Iran. We'll be back in just a moment. As we said earlier in the broadcast, the U.S. does not intend to ever make a public assessment of how many Iraqi soldiers have been killed or wounded in this war, but the number is known to be very, very high. Some of the Iraqi wounded have been fortunate enough to get American care. Here's ABC's John Lawrence. Thousands of Iraqi wounded prisoners of war are being given emergency medical treatment that had been intended for Americans. The quality of care is the same. I guess you, you really don't look at them as enemy other than uh, they're human beings too. They were sent over there to do a jab just like we were sent here to do a jab. Whoever uh, wins, I guess we're going to win, but we still have to take care of them. After being given treatment at a field hospital behind the front lines, the Iraqis are loaded aboard medical evacuation flights to take them farther to the rear. The system was set up to save lives, and it is working. Are you glad these are not Americans? That's the one part that I am glad, that the uh, American casualty rate is low. We're seeing more enemy prisoners of war that have been um, injured, and we're moving them, so that's comforting in that, in that way. In flight aboard an American C-130 medevac, the Iraqi soldiers are suffering from a wide range of war wounds from bullets, shrapnel fragments, bomb blasts, burns, and combat shock. Start another load. Let's go here. Most of the prisoners were wounded on the first day of the ground war. For them, the war is over. The more we pull them out, the sooner the war will be over. But generally, we just do patient care. We try not to think of them as an enemy because we have an oath within ourselves to take care of the patients. Many of these wounded Iraqi soldiers who were left to die on the battlefield by their own retreating army, now owe their lives to the emergency medical treatment of the United States military. John Lawrence, ABC News, Saudi Arabia. Some of the doctors involved in Desert Storm are reservists. In fact, more than 3,000 doctors have been called to duty with American forces all over the world as part of the call-up for the Gulf. Like other reservists, the doctors are finding that they and their families are being asked to pay a high price at home. Here's ABC's Ken Kashiwahara. They are treating casualties in the Persian Gulf, staffing the military hospitals in Europe, serving at medical facilities at home. Thousands of reserve doctors called to active duty, leaving behind lucrative practices and the expenses of keeping their practices open until they return. Mortgages, staff salaries, insurance payments. Juan Tour, now a Navy physician, makes $60,000 a year in the military. He used to make 200000 as a burn and trauma specialist. Professionally, it's my duty to do the best I can for this country. Fine. Economically, it'll kill me. In Frankfurt, Germany, some reservists say they signed up because of the extra income, others because they wanted to serve their country. Few expected they would have to dip into their savings or face closing their practices if they are gone too long. We're really living a dual life. We're trying to maintain a semblance of our practices back home with all the financial responsibilities that come from that, as well as practice here. When her husband was sent to Saudi Arabia, Laurie Lorenzetti found herself with half the income she was used to, six children to support and a medical practice to run. I didn't know anything about it. And all of a sudden, you know, they called him one night, he was gone the next day, and it was all in my hands. To keep her husband's office open, she has had to lay off some of his staff. In times of war, civilian doctors are crucial to the military. Sixty percent of the Army's physicians are reservists. But because of their financial losses, many say they may have to resign after the war is over. I would say that approximately 80 percent of the physicians have thought about dropping out of the reserves after, after they're back. 
And certainly that's crossed my mind and my wife's mind and my family's mind, too. I think that we have a serious potential problem if we do not address the needs of those mobilized health care providers uh, upon demobilization. The Army wants Congress to come up with a better pay and benefits package for reserve doctors. Otherwise, the concept of relying on weekend medical warriors in future wars could become a casualty of this one. Ken Kashiwahara, ABC News. We'll be back in just a moment. Some of the other news today. In Washington, the Senate Ethics Committee has effectively closed its books on the case of the Keating Five. The five senators accused of using their influence to help a powerful savings and loan operator. As we reported last night, the committee has decided that only one of the five should be brought up before the full Senate. Here's ABC's Cokie Roberts. A war has been declared, waged, and almost won in the time it's taken the Ethics Committee to decide that four of the Keating Five deserve nothing more than a mild rebuke. The committee investigated whether the senators acted improperly in their attempts to help indicted savings and loan operator Charles Keating, who contributed more than a million dollars to their combined campaigns. The verdict? Only California Democrat Alan Cranston should be considered for possible censure or expulsion. Senator Cranston may have engaged in improper conduct, which may reflect upon the Senate. As to the other four senators, Republican John McCain and Democrats John Glenn, Donald Regal, and Dennis DeConcini, the committee found that some had exercised poor judgment, some had been insensitive, some behaved in a manner the panel, quote, does not condone, but none requires formal punishment. The committee's criticism is tough enough, according to the senator who argued for strong sanctions. I don't think you uh, would... Uh think that you'd been dealt with lightly if your peers had judged you as these men have been judged. The head of common cause, which brought the complaints in the first place, begs to differ. What you see here today is the Senate acting as a club to protect its own. Spotlight shone at the start of the Keating Five investigation, but with the closing arguments came war. The Ethics Committee and the colleagues it was considering disappeared from the news and from public pressure to act. Cokie Roberts, ABC News, Capitol Hill. Late today, Senator Cranston said, it is clear that I have been unfairly singled out despite the evidence. The federal government and the state of Alaska announced today that Exxon has agreed to pay more than a billion dollars for damages caused by the spill from the Exxon Valdez. The money will be used to clean up and restore natural resources in Prince William Sound. Exxon still faces criminal charges. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrials gained more than 24 points today to close at 28.89, and the trading was heavy. We'll have a final report in just a moment. Finally this evening from liberated Kuwait, ABC Sam Donaldson has made the trip now from Saudi Arabia into Kuwait City. We called him up and asked him if he'd tell us what he saw along the way. Here's what he brought. The Kuwaitis had seen the battle come through and the soldiers. Today it was a caravan of civilians, American reporters and Kuwaiti merchants and officials returning from exile. A cavalcade of cars and buses that somehow said the civilized world was coming back in. And what the newcomers saw was wholesale devastation along the highway and in the distance one of the many huge oil refinery fires burning fiercely, blotting out the sun with its dense dark smoke. But it wasn't only oil facilities that had been torched. Many hotels and public buildings, like this Holiday Inn, were firebombed at the end. It was late Sunday, says the night manager, that the Iraqi soldiers pulled out and left their final calling card. Yeah, when you refused to go out, they said, OK, you guys don't go out, we burn you with this. And they wanted the keys to the, to the larder. Yeah, they wanted the keys to the storeroom, to the buses, but we refused. Our staff had already taken the keys and gone off from here. And they threatened to shoot uh, the person who had the keys? Yes, they threatened to shoot the person. If they found the person who had the keys, they said we would shoot him. But they wouldn't find us. Now, how do you feel about this? It's craziness. It's madness. Madness, yes. The devastation and brutality here will take some time to be completely added up. It may never be forgiven. 
but one gets the sense that the Kuwaiti spirit is alive and well. No amount of torching has been able to burn that out. Sam Donaldson, ABC News, Kuwait City. To remind you, President Bush is going to speak to the nation at 9 o'clock this evening, Eastern Time. We shall be here, of course. We believe he is going to announce that the war is over. Certainly the last major battle of the war is virtually over as of this hour. Hundreds of American tanks against the remains of Iraq's Republican Guard forces. The commanding general, German, General Norman Schwarzkopf, says Allied forces have accomplished their mission and that the Iraqi army no longer poses a threat to its neighbors. In Kuwait City, as you've heard, people have danced in the streets today to celebrate the liberation of their country from the Iraqis. And at the United Nations, the Security Council rejected another conditional peace proposal from Iraq. So for the Iraqis, the squeeze goes on. That's our report on World News. Back at 9 o'clock Eastern Time, I'm Peter Jennings. Have a good evening. This has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source.